what is it about evil kid movies taking place in the wintertime? The Good Son, The Omen, The Children, Orphan, and this week's movie, Devil Times 5. Devil Times 5 is a 1974 horror film that was partially directed by Sean McGregor and finished by David Shelton. The movie begins in the dead of winter with a van full of deranged children. Meanwhile, Rick, a guy with a comb-over that makes Donald Trump's look good, is picking up his girlfriend Julie. Is that even a comb-over? It's sort of a comb to the middle and forward. They're headed to the mountains to spend the weekend with Papa Doc, Rick's boss and Julie's father. Back at the van, the driver hits a patch of ice and drives right into a Benny Hill sketch. Did they almost run over a crew member? The van rolls down the cliff, only now they're running it in slow motion. Did someone just discover they could change the speeds of the film? Rick's talking to Julie. White guys never look good with just a mustache. Black guy with a mustache? Badass. White guy with a mustache? Sex offender. Over in the van, the two adult passengers are dead, but the children are still alive. The kids are Brian, Susan, David, Mo, and Sister Hannah. All right, kids, be sure to pack up those donuts before you trek through the snow. Rick and Julie are driving to meet her father. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be the middle of winter. There's a new cold front moving in from the north. Temperatures will drop to 18 degrees above zero tonight in the mountains, reaching a warm, sunny 37 degrees tomorrow by noon. The trees still have leaves on them, and flowers are in bloom. This music makes the movie sound less like a horror film and more like an episode of The Brady Bunch. The driver somehow survived the crash and heads after the children. Rick and Julie meet up for a drink with Papa Doc, Lovely, Harvey, and Ruth before heading to the house. That Ron Jeremy? Harvey's upset because he's being passed over for a promotion. Papa Doc, um, wasn't I supposed to? I mean, wasn't that job promised, uh... My pimp hat is on. This conversation's over. Hey guys, you might be able to see the road better if you clear that snow off. They make it to the house and wake up Ralph, Papa Doc's eh, special assistant. Lovely's having Ralph put away her clothes. Then it gets weird. Do you like me, Ralph? You're, you're, you're a nice lady. Really weird. Come on, you're tired. Really, really weird. Put me down on the bed, Ralph. On the bed? On the bed, Ralph. On the bed. That's right. Ralph? There's a lot like the first time I had sex. Pull your pants down. Julie shows up and interrupts what could have been a memorable evening for poor Ralph. Lovely tells Julie that she slept with Jack, and the movie turns into an episode of Jerry Springer. Oh, I like where this is going. Did they just put in a cat noise during a cat fight? Ruth shows up, the two stop fighting, and Lovely's tits keep falling out. In a scene crucial to the plot, Ralph explains his dinner plans for the week. I made the chicken bear last night. Bear last time because I put too many spices. This is like the male version of riding on the bus with my sister. Jesse's delicious. He's going to take me today to get a new toilet seat because mine got broken and was sliding. The kids make it to Papa Doc's mansion and hide in the guest house. The driver's following the kids' footprints. This is supposed to be the driver? Wasn't this the driver? And the kids hide out waiting for him and... Alright, who's this guy now? They ambush the guy and proceed to beat him to death in slow motion. Sure. I don't think this scene needed to be six uninterrupted minutes in slow motion. Unless they were going for something like this. For a guy who was just stabbed with a pitchfork, beaten with a sledgehammer, and whipped with chains, there seems to be a serious lack of blood. Ugh, murder really takes it out of these kids. I'm tired. Hey, are you in the mood? No? Uh, you better drink more of this then. 
Julie's telling Rick how she doesn't like Lovely. At this point, the soundtrack becomes self-aware. My baby's jealous. Rick and Julie then have some sloppy 70s sex. Julie's pretty and all, but seeing this is like watching your parents do it. The next day, Harvey's trying to either put the moves on Ruth or twist her head off. Ruth tells Harvey she'll sleep with him when she has more booze. Outside, the kids cut the phone line. Ruth goes to get some more liquor, and how much has she had to drink that she doesn't notice five children in the room with her? Everyone comes out to see why Ruth is yelling. Little people! Did she forget the word for children? What do you mean, what do I mean? I mean people! The kids tell the adults that they were in a crash and they came here for shelter. Could somebody get Rick a shirt? Mo is sick, so Papa Doc calls Lovely to look at her. Why does he ask her to check out the kids? Isn't Rick a doctor? And Harvey a doctor? But you'd think that a young doctor that was being considered to head up a new complex wouldn't mind putting in a little extra time. Papa Doc tries to call for help, but the phone's out. So instead of maybe driving the kids into town and notifying the police of a fatal car crash, the group just goes about their selfish business. Harvey's going to have to work out an awful lot if he's ever going to fit into that dress. Julie's talking to Susan, who is showing just a little bit of foreshadowing. We're going to get you back to your parents as soon as possible. As soon as possible? Uh, more like, eh, eventually. The adults and kids gather for dinner. Again, Rick and Julie give zero fucks about these kids. What are you two cooking up? A little ski trip for tomorrow. Anybody want to come? After dinner, the kids are setting up some MacGyver-style traps. Ralph goes out to check on the generator and sets off the trap. <laughs> Rick and Julie go down to the wine cellar. Boy, I sure could go for a Budweiser. Lovely shows up and they share their suspicions about the kids. Harvey beats David at chess and, see? Rage quitting was around long before Xbox Live. Moe's checking out Papa Doc's fish. What are they? They're piranha. Rick's getting a shower and Lovely's waiting for him. He spurns her advances and, oh, do we need this? Thankfully, Rick drops her off and leaves. He heads out into the freezing cold to try to jog off his blue balls. He heads into the guest house and finds Ralph's body. He goes to get Papa Doc and they tell the rest of the adults. The kids sabotage the car so they can't go for help. None of this would have even been an issue if you would have driven them to town yesterday. Rick goes to talk to Julie. Okay, something really suspicious is going on, so we need to round everyone up. The first thing we should do is separate. I don't know what's going on around here, but I think we'd better get everybody together. Is there anybody upstairs? I don't know. I'll see. What? David's in Harvey's room doing... Uh... <laughs> Ruth wants to leave, but Harvey explains why they're stuck. Look at that. The snow's ten feet deep and the phone lines are dead. Ten feet of snow, you say? Harvey goes out to cut some wood, and David whacks him in the back with an axe. I think he threw it at him. Who threw it at him? George. George did it. Who the hell is George? Rick and Julie go to tell Ruth about Harvey. Here, dear, have some more booze. The safest thing to do is stay together in one room start out in the morning. Lovely disagrees and thinks the best thing to do in a situation where people are turning up dead is to go and take a hot bath. Why are you playing in here? Answer me! Lovely's taking a bath and the kids kill her by holding her down and dumping piranha on her. This isn't exactly the music I would have chosen for the being eaten by a piranha scene. I realize the house is big and all, but none of the others can hear her flailing for her life. Once again, I'm going to put you in harm's way for no reason. I want you to round everybody up and get them down here right now, okay? All right. Hurry up. They go to check on Lovely and finally see what the kids have been doing. Rick tries to stop him, only to get knocked out not once, but twice. Papa Doc finds the kids, but walks right into another trap. Brian dumps gas on Ruth and Susan sets her on fire. Rick and Julie barricade themselves in a room in the house. Murderous children on a rampage? What better time to take a nap? David climbs up the side of the house and spears Julie through the window. I gotta say, she kinda deserved that. The kids are bored so they make a snowman out of Papa Doc. Rick tries to sneak out while the kids are distracted, but the house is surrounded by lethal traps. 
What is this, Tecmo's deception? The kids hear this and come up to finish the job. They're now playing with the corpses of the adults. They get bored and they decide to go out and look for some new toys. The movie was filmed in Lake Arrowhead, California in Los Angeles, California for an undisclosed amount. Originally the film was called People Toys, but it was changed to The Horrible House on the Hill. Some distributors didn't like the name, so they changed it to Devil Times 5, which is how it's most commonly known. Director Sean McGregor sold the treatment to Jordan Wank, an attorney who wanted to be a producer. He even named his production company Barrister Productions. They then brought in producer David Shelton to work on the film. This being his first film, Wank was an inexperienced producer. McGregor was making all kinds of mistakes, and Sheldon tried to contact Wank about them, but he did nothing. McGregor wrote the screenplay with his then-friend John Duran, who played Ralph. McGregor got into frequent arguments with both Sheldon and Duran, so he started ripping pages out of the script to spite them. By throwing out pages of the script, he ruined all the characters' backstories. This is why the characters' motivations in the film is somewhat sketchy. At one point, Sheldon was so frustrated over the film that he got into a fist fight with McGregor. Finally, after four weeks of filming and almost the entire budget, Sheldon was able to have McGregor removed from the film. They assessed what was shot and discovered they only had 38 minutes of material. It's an example of how while many producers cause problems for directors, they're a necessary evil because certain directors need someone to keep them in line. Months after the first filming, Sheldon was able to get the cast back for a week of reshoots. And this presented a few problems. First, the film was supposed to be set in winter, but it was now summer, so most of the snow on the ground was melted. They did their best, but it's hard to mask when in one scene there's a foot of snow, and then in the next you can see the ground. The next problem was the young Leif Garrett, who played David. In the movie, he had long hair, but after he left, he got a crew cut to be in the movie Macon County Line. To fix this, they created the story arc where he was a cross-dresser to explain why he was wearing a wig. The biggest problem now was that they only had a week to do reshoots. They had to film enough material to fill in all the missing spots from the previous 38 minutes. This is why there's all these oddities, like three different actors playing the bus driver and the unusual edits. I love you! <laughs> we all gotta get out of here. Once the week was up, they had to make do with what they had and mix together sort of a Franken film. Sheldon wrote most of the additional scenes and did his best to try to have it all make sense. After the film was finished, they had to take McGregor to court to have his name removed from the film. They were able to have his name removed as the writer and co-producer and listed him as the pseudonym of Dylan Jones. In an interview, Sheldon went on to talk about how unprofessional McGregor was. He left his first movie halfway through and one of the actors had to finish directing it. Then it was rumored that he was removed from the film that he was directing right before this. While I like Devil Times 5, a movie about the making of the movie would almost certainly be a better film. Although I have to say, Sheldon did a great job of being able to reconstruct and save the film. Sheldon managed to film more in one week than McGregor did in four. With everything it went through, it should have been an unwatchable mess, but it ended up being quite entertaining. A large part is due to the children. A lot of killer kid movies have the kids acting like adults. In this, they acted like kids, which made it so much creepier. Everything was just a game, and even though they were brutally murdering people, they never stopped acting like kids. I can carry both of them. I can carry both of them. I was talking to some fool down the hall, so shoot me. Whoopie doo. David was played by Leif Garrett, and Mo was played by Dawn Lynn, who were real life brother and sister. Lovely was played by Carolyn Steller, who was their mother. Lynn said it was very odd because she was one of the kids that killed Lovely, so essentially, she killed her own mother. That's got to be a little weird for an eight-year-old's brain to process. In that scene, the piranhas were real, but they were dead. They still had their teeth, and one of them sliced Steller's leg open, so she had to be rushed to the hospital. Veteran actor Gene Evans played Papa Doc. His vision was so bad that he was actually legally blind for most of his career something he kept a secret from everyone. He was great in the film, and of everyone involved, I was on his side. He was just a hard-working old grump that hated everything, which, oddly enough, I identified with. That's not funny. Well, the grumpy part, at least. Listen, you boozed-up old broad. Can't you leave her alone? I'd love to. 
Sister Hannah was played by, and I think this is how it's pronounced, Gail Smale. She was also director Sean McGregor's girlfriend at the time. They put her in heavy makeup and dyed her hair because her character was supposed to be an albino. Even though she played a kid, she was actually 27 years old. Brian was played by Tierre Turner. He's done plenty of acting in small roles over the years, but he's had much greater success as a stuntman. He's worked on everything from Die Hard 2 to Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, and even the recent Star Trek. They didn't have a lot of money for stunts, so they only used stuntmen for the really dangerous things, like when Papa Doc smashes through the door, or when Ruth was set on fire. Things like the lovely Julie Cat fight were played by the actresses, and it really was stellar being dragged naked through the snow. That's dedication. Sorrel Book played Harvey. Even though he has 123 credits to his name, he is known by far as the one and only Boss Hogg from the Dukes of Hazard. While some of the scenes dragged on too long, like the murder of the driver, this was understandable because of the nonsense from the original director. With the limited time for the reshoots, they had to stretch some things out to get the film to 90 minutes. While movies about killer kids is nothing new, even back then, could you imagine doing a film like this today? Here are children. Genuine children stabbing, slashing, and laughing as they murder adults. Now they can't even adapt a book like The Hunger Games to film without increasing the age of the characters and shaking the camera violently during every death sequence so you can't see anything. This strikes me as odd. To me, it says Hollywood thinks it's okay to make a movie where children kill other children, but only if we can't see it. Oh, the murder's still there, and they want to market it towards kids but they would rather stylize and hide it to lessen the impact instead of showing it at face value and maybe, just maybe, staying true to the shocking nature of the source material. You know, the books the same children have already read? joking matter. I was just thinking, when is the beer commercial going to come on? Roast! Julie, get ready, it's boner time! This is what I call the uncomfortable erection run. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs>